Okay, the doors are shut, so it's time to begin. Um, I'm Mia Ridge. I'm a cultural heritage technologist, and I'm chair of the museum's computer group, um, which will become relevant to this session because a lot of the speakers today are talking about the challenges that cultural organisations are facing in dealing with the digital, not only in terms of the technology, but in terms of the cultural change that that brings, changing audience expectations, and really getting to grips with the processes and the time required to do digital work. The digital technologies that you see in museums and libraries and archives are generally just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the processes that go on. Um, often when I say I'm a museum technologist, people expect that it relates really simply to the kinds of interactives that you see kids using. But there's a lot of work in terms of collections management, conservation, um, procurement processes. So we'll be hearing from um, some speakers about the implications of technology for cultural organisations. Um, and some of the solutions and issues that they've found along the way. Our three speakers in order are Seb Chan, who um, Seb comes to us from the Smithsonian's Design Museum, the Cooper Hewitt, which their claim to fame is apparently the only museum that is featured in a Ben Stiller film. Um, Seb has to leave to get to the airport, so when the bongs go at the end of this session, he's going to turn into Cinderella and run for a taxi. Um, our next speaker is Alex, who you'll probably know from his work um, as a founder of Hide and Seek. Um, we've already heard him today in conversation raising some of the issues that I think are really relevant to this conference. Um, and our final speaker is Ben, who's dashed over from Italy and will be talking about the Un Monastery. So without any further ado, let's have Seb Chan. Hi. So, um I was thinking about how this would work, and I think really what I'm going to talk, talk, a, talk a bit about is the way um, you know, my museum is trying to figure out what it ac ac actually means to live in the, uh, the, the present. And unfortunately for, for the design muse museum, my fonts aren't actually working, so uh, please bear, bear kind of with the bad fonts. Uh, so I'm here, I'm at this very old museum, which uh, was Carnegie's old, old home in uh, sort of New York. Um, and we moved into this building in the 1970s. It wasn't built to um, house a sort of museum at all. Um, and what's interesting about this is we're in the, we're in the process of renovating this completely. So I, so I came, came across from Sydney, where I worked in a very large uh, science museum to help uh, the, the Cooper Hewitt turned this building in, in, into a place that could not only collect the present but also show it. Uh, we're one of uh, 19, uh, 19 Smithsonian museums and we are the only museum really in uh, you know, New York from the Smithsonian family. Um, and interestingly, we're also the only Smithsonian muse museum to charge admission. Uh, we're located two blocks north of the Guggenheim, which is an interesting uh, challenge for us because the tourists who visit the Met and the Guggenheim and MoMA have all run out of money by the time they reach the, 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 uh, the Guggenheim. And they're also, of course, suff suffering from museum fat fatigue. Their legs are sore, the kids are cross, they haven't found any seats in the previous museums to relax on, the cop... Uh, Coffee, uh, coffee's bad, all that. Um, so we're just doing a minor renovation, so the whole of building is being changed. So this is, uh, we should open towards the end of the, 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 the kind of year, but this is a shot from prob probably about uh, nine months ago. So the ceilings are being retouched and all of this. Um, the Cooper Hewitt, interestingly, has always had a working, working collection. So the collection be began at, uh, the, uh, was kind of housed at the Cooper Union um, and collected by the Hewitt sist uh, sisters in the early 20th century. And this was a collection that was made to, uh, to be used. And you can see here uh, women you know, studying it in uh, de 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 detail here. And we also have this sort of Pinterest view of the, the museum exhibits in the past too. And this is a, a very old fas fashionable way of showing collections, but I think this now rep represents more of where uh, museums are heading with these super dense uh, displays that work very well in the di digital space as well. 
Um, and of course, Eleanor Hewitt, one of uh, the Hewitt sisters who founded the, the, the museum's collection, wrote in 1919 uh, nine, that, in fact, the, this, this, this collection wasn't about preservation. It was, entire, it, was entire, it was entirely aimed at passing on, you know, traditions, and its use trumped, 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 uh, trumped of course, pre the, the, the preservation urge. Um, so I kind of see, in through, through, through my work in Australia and in other parts of the world, that museums can operate as a global seed bank of ideas. But for, for, the, for this to occur, we need museums to open up their, their collections and uh, use the net network to realise this. And I think the Hewitt sisters', sisters orig, um, sort of original aims feed into this idea pretty well. Um, of course, the Hewitt sisters were also the 20th century elites. So we have this strange collection that is for the public, owned uh, now by the Smithsonian, a public museum, uh, collected really by this very small per per percent, uh, percentage of new, uh, new, uh, new York society. And of course we have the challenge, we have a lot of things. We have 200, 212,000 things, and that little building can fit about 400 of them at one time. So most will never be seen. And unfortunately, when I arrived, only 70% of them had actually been photographed yet. So we're working on that too. So that's sort of the uh, challenge. Uh, but it's a pretty good co uh, co um, collection. Posters, uh, te textiles, bird, bird cages, uh, product of a design that came into the, the collection in the, the 1990s. Uh, wallpapers. We have a huge amount of wallpapers, and we have these, uh, de you know, decorative arts pieces that really, unless you actually get up, get up close to to them, you never get to see working. So this, we've been using uh, YouTube as a way of showing that the collections ac actually being used. Um, we have buttons. We have cr cricket cages, which were a thing. You carried your pet pet crick, cricket around, and this the spanking cat. This is the uh, mas mascot for my team, that is of course a little bit na naughty, uh, which is the point. Um, so really, uh, you know, my museum has got got to revel in the quirks of its collection, because visitors will always ask these the, the, these kinds of things: how, why, does it work? Why, why is it important? And the thing they, all, uh, they always ask that we never say is, what did it cost? Uh, so this is about people, you know, stories, places. And, and we're shift, shifting from this model, this dec decorative arts museum model, to more of a science museum model. So we're very much now focused on the processes of uh, de uh, design and the pro pro processes of making. So when I came, uh, came, back, came across and built, built a team, I uh, was asked to embed digital in the, org the organisation, but also the building itself. Uh, one of the first um, things we did was release the collection data on uh, GitHub as cultural source, source code, um, an API, of course, and we really fo focused on this notion, no, notion of you know, privileging the browsing experience rather than the search, ex search experience for our collection. So you can nav 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 navigate the collection on the web by colour and these sorts of things. Um, but really my, my challenge is we're trying to build this house in the, 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 the middle of the very, very, very fast flowing river of change. Uh, and so we're trying to de design the building and the way uh, the the organisation works to be rather rather rather, rather supple, um, and capacity building for the for the present is really what this is about. Um, because in the designed world now, we know that the that the their design of things now is about systems co and code. So this requires, of course, new forms of curatorial pra uh, you know, practice. And we've moved from collecting things like this. This is a 3D print, print, printed chair that we collected in uh, 2011. Unfortunately, we didn't collect the source code for it. We collected the chair as a finished work. We also, of course, collected these, which every science museum's got too, uh, but you can never turn, turn a kind of them on. And so there's no sense of the way they act actually worked in the ecosystems of the app kind of store or their soft software or their operating systems. So about a year ago now, we collected the first app. 
uh, for the uh, you know for the for the museum's collection. This is a data visualization app. It's a, a music player called uh, Planetary. What is it, it, interesting about this is, of course, that as you play play tracks through it. Uh, the you know the the the, the bright uh, brightness of the sun will change, and it depends on your music collection. All of these these sorts of things. We collected this as its raw source code, and we collected it uh, as a GitHub you know rep repository, and that GitHub repository is now public, and it is the versioned uh, code. So we can now step you know step back back through the diff different versions. That, that made this soft, uh, software, which I think is a new, new thing for the design museum to move, move away from the finished work to act, actually collecting all of the working kind of prototypes and being, able, being uh, and have, um, um, and having the, the ability to, to, to examine those. And of course, we open sourced it too because to, to preserve this, we feel we need the, uh, you know, the community's help to keep keep this running as um, um, as, um, uh, um, as an idea, uh, but it also, of course, because we're a uh, museum, it sits on a shelf. It sits on a shelf, you know, printed out, uh, and in a climate uh, you know climate controlled closet. Um, some other things we've started to think about, and the graphic and the graphic design curators have begun to ask: Well, if you're collecting iPad apps as code. Should we also collect the original files of posters and books? What does that look look like? Should we collect the layered Photoshop files with with works? How do we pre, you know preserve those and present these? Um, and of course, this is also product you know product design. So we have the Dreyfus. Uh, thermostat from the 1950s. We also have the Nest. We have version one Nest, and we have the version and the version kind of two Nest. We also just 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 acquired the 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 paper sketches for uh, for the Nest too. But we haven't yet acquired the soft software. And if kind of we ever we ever we ever did acquire the soft software for the Nest, would uh, we also need to collect the data sets of users using um, the the Nest? Their, uh, their, their, their data, data, data sets that make the nest adapt to uh, their houses to make sense of this. Because the future, as you know, Trevor Owen says, is that these logs of, you know, tr sort of you know, transactional data become increasingly important for the future to, to, to make sense of the present day. Um, and we see also in the developer com you know, community too. This is uh, th this is a comment from the, the, the people who made the game Threes. They actually have just uh, released the email archive doc documenting their, their design process too. So if a museum was to to, to collect Threes, a very a very important part of that would also be to collect that archive, but also perhaps all of the the clones of Threes. That uh, the ar archive is talk talking about, um, and, and really for, for me, these are all experiments, and we're trying trying to figure out what it ac ac actually means to collect all of this, and then how do we show it within a you know museum in a sen sensible way? Because when you visit a uh, you know museum, still you expect to to see the finished sing sing singular work. It's very hard to uh, show in a gallery setting. These uh, you know prototypes and that process of change. So and of course we we may be wrong. So thanks a lot. Cool. My name is Alex Fleetwood and I'm the founder and director of Hide and Seek, uh, which, um, as Mia said, uh, closed at the end of last year. Um, um, so I am coming at this from a slightly different place. Hide and Seek was a studio that uh, attempted over the course of its seven year life to invent new kinds of play. We tried to define a progressive space in the cultural sector where it was possible to explore the cultural potential of games and we collaborated with a lot of different artists and cultural organizations in an attempt to realize that aim. And um, so I'm really interested in exploring uh, 
a possible future of an institutional landscape that includes uh, new cultural organizations that can support digital, digital cultures by design um, that are uh, intended um, to uh, actively enable uh, cultural forms such as games. And I'm going to kind of contextualize that by talking specifically about some ideas for uh, a national game space. Um, I guess it's my view that right now there's an unacceptable disconnect between um, many of the digital cultures that we participate in, create meaning through uh, play, and the civic culture of what constitutes art according to um, the buildings and institutions that we have in our cities to sustain them. Um, I think that we need many new institutions, not just a national game space, but that's my personal uh, field of interest, and so that's the one I'm going to focus on today. So I'm going to start by kind of imagining what a national game space might look like, some of the things that it might contain and what people might do there, and then I'm going to just refer back to um, the past to look at the conditions that supported the emergence of other public interventions into our common culture, um, such as the British Institute, Film Institute and Channel 4. So um, this quote from Cara Ellison um, I think is, a, is her way of expressing that, um, but more passionately and more potently. I think there is increasingly this deep sense of frustration in the independent video game community that um, it's a marginalized activity in many ways. And um, we're starting to express that in different ways. Oh. So, um, Let's imagine what a national game space might be. I mean, I think uh, in this vision, I think game culture has moved alongside the other types of culture that lay claim to space in our towns and cities, as well as cinemas, opera houses, art galleries, and theaters. There will be game spaces, places where the continuously evolving practice of games and play can be experienced as part of our civic life. There will be big ones in places like London and Manchester and Glasgow, and smaller ones anywhere where there are enough people to sustain them. Game spaces by the beach, game spaces in villages, game spaces nestled on the edge of national parks. Going out to play will be as common an activity as going to eat or going to shop. These game spaces will inevitably be sites of action both in the real world and on digital platforms and devices. And the infrastructure of those buildings will therefore be conceived by architects and engineers to enable play. You know, right now, we have buildings that are configured around performance, display, uh, consumption. Um, we need a different kind of infrastructure if we're going to genuinely be able to play within a building. And I think more than anything, what that means is uh, plasticity, um, a, a changeable infrastructure, one that can mutate and evolve in different ways, that can admit different kinds of input and output very straightforwardly. And that would then enable us to admit different kinds of play, different kinds of players, different kinds of technology. Games, more than any form of our culture, team with systemic and te technological diversity, making use of every different kind of technology that humans have ever invented. As uh, academic and game designer Eric Zimmerman put it, uh, media and culture in the ludic century is, ex is increasingly system systemic, modular, customizable, and participatory. Game spaces will be conceived and built to support this multifaceted culture, enabling each individual player to set their own relationship with the space that they are in. Um, in these game spaces, there will be people. People playing, people not playing, people doing whatever it is that they want to do. And in doing this, they will gently lay to rest the ghost of the word gamer. Game playing will be a cultural lit literacy which is simply taken for granted. Then they will be comfortable with the complexity of the games they encounter, playing the ones that suit them. The playing public will be supported in this by dedicated salaried professionals who care about how games are presented, who reach out to people with passion and enthusiasm, and who solve problems of display and interaction in ingenious ways. These people will decide what games you should play. Um, they will make recommendations based on their insight and experience, and they will argue vehemently using the force of the spaces they inhabit for you to see their view. We will invent new job titles for these people as words like curation start to lose some of their meaning. These game spaces will be in turn supported by national and supranational organizations that will care for games in other ways. They will take responsibility for archiving games and preserving hardware. They'll focus on education and ensuring equality of access to the tools of game making. They'll create platforms and business models that coexist with those owned and maintained by companies and invest in games with a view to creating different kinds of value. In this landscape, 
It will be possible for game makers from different backgrounds to receive training, support, and encouragement at every stage of their career. They will be encouraged to develop an individual voice in the context of a public service framework that supports the provision of a broad range of high quality and diverse games that in particular demonstrate innovation, experiment and creativity in both the form and content of games and appeal to the tastes and interests of a culturally diverse society. Creators will of course still work with publishers, with brands, with investors and with uh, platforms like the App Store and Steam and of course they will still make games independently, distributing them and charging for them as they wish. The national game space simply offers an alternative, one where different kinds of support are offered. And finally, it's important to talk about resources. All of these things that I have described will cost money. It will be expensive to do these things. But the money will have been found. And through investment from our government, through investment from philanthropists, and through a smart business model that recycles uh, revenue from games commissioned by the space, the ongoing existence of a national game space can continue. It, could, should, it can and should operate commercially. It should derive revenues from multiple sources and make use of concessions, for example, um, uh, access to attention provided by our broadcasters or access to spectrum provided by the government that enable it to plan for the long term. Again, all of these resources should ultimately be put to use in the service of cultural creation and access. We don't have to look too far back into our history to discover models for this future. This is part of the broadcasting license for Channel 4. Prohibited from making its own programs, the channel was a powerful platform for independent voices and ideas, a commissioning fund available to artists, performers, journalists, and producers whose work demonstrated adherence to the channel's founding principles of innovation, diversity, education, and distinctiveness. Go back a little further to 1947, and I recommend that you read this in your best uh, Radio 2 announcer's voice. Um, the set of recommendations for the British Film Institute uh, through the Radcliffe Report um, sparked the rapid growth of an organization which had existed in prototypical form for about 20 years um, under the director of David Foreman, including the creation of the telecinema, later the National Theatre, now the BFI South Bank, um, as part of the Festival of Britain. I think if you think about the imagination and energy that was um, at play in our civic uh, our civil servants and our government um, to imagine and create these new institutions. Um, you can see, um, one, how dynamic and extraordinary it was to take that step, but also that there is uh, a relationship between these inventions, this, this creation, this innovation at the level of the institution, and um, the work of filmmakers um, in the present day. I mean, I would cite, for example, uh, the effects of the policy making that gave rise to the BFI and Channel 4 and the work of filmmakers like uh, Clio Barnard and Steve McQueen, uh, both of whom uh, had uh, successful careers as fine artists. They were both supported by Channel 4 in the creation of their first features, and they are both now enjoying international recognition of their latest films, wowing festival audiences around the world, and in the case of Steve McQueen, enjoying extraordinary commercial and Oscar-winning success. Their unique and distinctive talent and vision was able to flourish, um, in part through, of course, their own brilliance and energy and endeavor, but also because there was this context in which their particular work could flourish. So what I hope I've briefly done in this talk is sketched out a new possibility uh, for new cultural institutions and systems that are designed um, to support game culture. I think it's important as we consider how existing cultural institutions evolve and innovate to note that sometimes the only way forward is to build something substantial, radical, and entirely new. Thank you. Okay. Um, so when I was thinking about the title of this session, Building Creative Institutions, I struggled a bit to decide <coughs> where to focus and exactly what learnings and experience to recount. Partly because I'm not really sure what is meant by creative and whether it's a term that I'd feel comfortable attributing to the things that I've been building. But let's assume, for the sake of what I'm about to cover, that creativity, it <coughs> in the context, refers to a space uh, refers to a space in which a group can act freely to express themselves and work together. To put forward a shared vision of a world 
one in which each individual is personally invested. And if this is the definition I am to use, then my talk will be concerned with the antagonism between our existing institution's ability to deliver on this and the process of building an institution that one hopes is capable of delivering on such things. It's probably also, <laughs> it's probably also useful uh, for me to highlight that right now I'm deeply embedded in an emergent process concerned with building an institution of this nature which consumes about 90% of my cognitive energy 24-7, so I'm not exactly centered right now. And since this session has changed to highlight, <coughs> since this session has changed somewhat, since the original format of 20-minute talk towards a more conversational one, I wanted to set out two areas of intention <coughs> with the intention of contributing to the quality of conversation that follows. To start, I'd like to address a number of issues that have arisen in recent times that define the limits of long-standing institutions and their role within society now. These limits, perhaps one def once defined as features, have, been, have in the present moment could probably be better understood as bugs in the system in needs of fixing. That is, if existing institutions want to continue to play a relevant role in the future. It's no secret that institutions are struggling to adjust to the cultural and technological changes that have come about in the last decade. So as material for further discussion, I highlight the following examples based on the assumption that, these, that there exists an emergent organizational form associated with network culture, which is actively undermining and transforming the way in which we structure society, and thus threatening to take away the power of long-standing institutions, be it museums, governments, or whatever. And so I'm going to cover these aspects of institutions at quite a fast pace. Culturally, many institutions strive for perfection and in their search tend to conceal failure. This has some negative side effects. One, it prevents the ability to turn back if something becomes a very obviously bad idea, which results in much more expensive mistakes. Two, it insists that something be perfect from the start, preventing the potential for iterative development over time. And probably, worst of all, other institutions aren't able to learn from the same mistakes. Institutions are extremely uncomfortable with taking risks, which is fairly reasonable when you consider that they're trying to stay alive and preserve knowledge over time. But as a result, they're slow to change, struggle to adapt, and are generally intensely inefficient. Hierarchy. It speaks for itself. The organizational structure in the present moment is top down for the most part in many institutions, which makes it difficult to compete with horizontal networks and a generation you can't recruit because they grew up experiencing alternative approaches to organizing and recognize hierarchy as an anathema to getting meaningful work done. Domination before participation. Locked into a competitive model, cultural institutions tend to see it as being in their interest to silo existing and evolving forms of knowledge restricting access from other institutions working in a similar field. In contrast, effective horizontal networks are built on participation and collaboration with few spectators. Institutions still struggle to mobilize a critical mass in the same way networks do, as they attempt to direct or own the flow instead of taking the appropriate place as participant. But I think we can be a bit more specific when we're talking in arts institution context. So, the notion of individuals as genius has led to the development of a long-standing framework which can comfortably accommodate only individuals and considers the attribution of collective effort as a dilution of such genius, a lack of capacity. The arts suffer from a shortage of the necessary skill sets, whether it be open source practices or new forms of organizing. The reason for this isn't immediately obvious. Originality. Built on a convincing model of scarcity, it's highly unlikely we're going to be torrenting artworks anytime soon, which means as a siloed discipline, the arts loses a lot of the added bonuses that come with this sort of infrastructure. Okay, so with those sweeping condemnations uh, out of the way, what's the next bit? So previously, um, I've usually highlighted these issues without a concrete lived example at least not one that I felt comfortable sharing in public. 
I'm in no way going to be putting this forward as a packaged solution to the issues that I outlined. But this is where I currently live, um, the city of Matera. It's one of the earliest human settlements in Europe, and it's here that we've begun to bring, build the first prototype for something called the Unmonastery, a project that has been in development as part of the Edge Riders Network for the past year or so, which asks a fundamental question. How can an institution be a friend or ally to an existing network? The founding model for the Unmonastery is defined by two tiers of needs. Firstly, those from the network of peers who initiated the project, defined by the need to have time and space to develop meaningful connections between individuals with working relationships that are built on trust. The need for supporting infrastructure and a place for those who are doing important work within society, the kind of important work that typically the nation state delivered to its citizens prior to becoming a vehicle for prevalent surveillance and oppression through severe austerity measures. So, in order to fulfill these needs in an honest manner, it's focused on addressing a set of broader problems in need of solutions, which are large numbers of disused property, austerity and the rollback of state service provision, and high intentional or unintentional unemployment. So the basic framework of our monastery is to combine these three issues by enabling capable individuals to become stewards of empty properties with the freedom to deliver services that make sense to the communities and networks they engage. In terms of gap analysis, it's worth considering that there are over 11 million empty properties throughout Europe and a steady 12% unemployment rate within Europe alone. The prototype is <laughs> two months in, uh, composed of a group from across Europe and North America who are living, eating and working together to realize a set of projects, which range from an open source solar tracking hardware, a Wi-Fi mesh network, an open tech school, through to a local for food supply chain for local producers. So the idea is bold, bordering on romantic, but modest in the geography it finds itself and the historical precedents it mines from. But with the desire to be useful, I think what's particularly relevant to the subject of institution building is the components and ethos that are being built and how they might be adapted to other contexts and existing models. So, our ethos, eth uh, ethos and values. Uh, the model's designed to be open source and replicable. The Unmonastery is intended to be an open use model based on iterative development that anybody can use. This extends through to the individual processes and tools we develop, which aim to be adaptable and usable by other initiatives. It's based on radical transparency. Everything we do is public, from conflict to toilet etiquette to finances. All of our processes are exposed online through various processes, platforms. The person, it's based on the idea that the person who does the work has the, doesn't have the power to direct other people to do that work, but the person who's doing it makes all the decisions. There are no super users in the Unmonastery. This is not true, this is not just true for the website, but across the project. No single individual has the ability to change everything, and as such, responsibility is high, highly dis distributed across the project. Our rituals and tradition. The Book of Mistakes is perhaps our most prized invention so far. Since embarking on the project, we've been documenting and publishing every single mistake we've made in detail so that others aren't doomed to repeat it. Prototyping. Everything in the Unmonastery is intended as a prototype and defined as such from, <coughs> from governance model to shelving units in order to highlight the imperfection of everything and encourage iterative development over time. Rigorous document, documentation as scripture. One of the problems with networked communities is the inability to store tacit knowledge over time. If someone in a network drops off, it can severely impair the ability of the group. Like actual monasteries, we have a tendency to meticulously write everything down and make it common practice to transfer logistical knowledge across the group. Liturgy. From the start, we establish a daily routine that ensures the group is conscious of the emotional state and capacity of individuals. Each day commences with the ringing of a bell at 7 a.m., followed by morning practice, which is a kind of improvisational clowning workshop, closely followed by an opening circle, in which individuals express their feelings and their hopes for the day ahead. 
This is shortly followed by a planning circle that follows a scrum project management methodology, and the rest of the day is punctuated by a similar rhythm. This might seem a bit strange, but <clears throat> what it enables is a group of relative strangers to come together and rapidly build trust in working relationships. There's one thing that's particularly diff different, um, and that's the network dependencies. Where our work fundamentally differs from typical institution building is its dependency on a large network, which has cradled and continues to foster the development of the project. For the Unmonastery, that network is Edge Riders, a community of around 2,000 individuals primarily throughout Europe. Edge Riders started out as a distributed think tank incubated by the Council of Europe, but within a year spun off into an autonomously run platform and corporate shell perhaps best described as a corporation without permission, meaning anyone within the network can use the representative model legal structure of the entity, which is intended as an interface for a world that tends to understand corporations but not communities. And so the Unmonastery is at this moment wholly dependent on a re reciprocal working relationship between a highly distributed network and a small group based at the pro prototype in Matera. It is this drive towards openness and continued collaborative development online that ensure the lights stay on in the building and the project survives. I want to stop here because I've probably run out of time, but to end on a question, is it actually possible to change the state of existing institutions to respect and uphold similar, similar values? So we have some time for discussion between the um, panelists. I thought it would be more interesting to engage people in conversation because that's the kind of thing you can only do when you have people together. Um, certainly for everyone, I think there's information online. You can find out more about their projects and about their work. Um, so we'll take questions from the audience as well as we, if we have time. Are there any questions to start with? Um, well, I suppose the question is, is mostly for Seb, but also for the other speakers. Um, um, uh, I was lucky enough to um, get Louise Shannon from the v um, uh, to talk to our MA curating students about her recent collecting, and in particular the collecting of the uh, prototype gun. Yep. Um, and she was describing how uh, what she actually has is a huge stack of legal papers as part of a curatorial practice. And I just wondered, if it, it, has it changed your practice and what objects you actually deal with? Yeah, I think it has. I mean, I think what, what's interesting with the other speakers too is that we're, we're playing around with this idea of do, do you try to ret retrofit an existing build, building and museum? Do you build a new one? Or do you build an entirely diff different type of you know, structure? And I think um, that unless the curatorial practice does change, we will be forced to do Ben's thing. And I'm not sure, I, I, th I think we lose stuff if we do Ben's thing, because we have these buildings as well, and do they just become tourist, uh, tourist traps? Uh, see also New York, generally. Um, but, but, you know, I think what's interesting about uh, acquiring, say, the le le legal papers and the, the, these sorts of things is what we're, what we're pushing very hard on is the public release of those. So actually to, to, to say, we're acquiring all of these things and you don't need to make an app appointment with the curator to see that big file of things the curator got with, you know, a chair or whatever it was in the past. That's also available with the collection record on the, the web, or it's also available in a pub, public space. So really trying, trying to make tra transparent the intangibility of a lot of the present is to say that, you know, co collect, collectively, say, the 3D print, printed gun is not that printout of the, the gun, but the manual for printing it, the code for, 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 for print printing it, as well as all these legal reg regulations and discussions around that code and, 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 and making that the thing people see, in quotes, rather, 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 rather than the end result that sits in a nice vit, you know, vitrine. And I don't know how we do that. I mean, we're all experimenting with, with that. And I think I've been in the 
reasonably fortunate position of trying, trying to help design gallery space, spaces that enable the showing of that. And I don't think we've got it right yet. And I think when you know, we reopen, we will be very much in a beta phase and we'll be very much trying to figure out, wow, we made all these great you know, new vitrines to, to store all the old things, but they're still really bad for these things that aren't things. You know, you know, and we, we, we will have made some, some attempts with the web and with GitHub and other things to expose that. But how do you show GitHub in a gallery? How does someone visit GitHub in the V&A? Like, what does that even look, look like? And that's sort of that experimental place I think we're playing, playing around with. I think that no, no, notion of playing around with um, experimentation and accept, um, accepting a fail, failure is a big philosophical shift for, for organisations. Because there is an important role for education to play, um, you know, uh, there's a powerful sense in which education is preparing um, curators, artists, performers for domains of cultural practice which are obsolete. And um, actually, when, you know, to what extent can educators in introduce the same sense of discursive experimentation into the course? Um, you know, that's where a lot of the most, you know, so Goldsmiths are probably a good example of a place where that's just kind of baked into the idea of what it is to participate in that institution. Um, and I think the, the rapidity with which that needs to happen is pretty urgent and because there is this kind of, you know, um, Heiner Goebbels, the brilliant theatre maker, did a wonderful talk at the Edinburgh Talent Symposium a couple of years ago, which you can find online, where he said, you know, um, the hardest people for him to work with as a non-traditional theatre maker are the young, uh, because they're the people with the strongest received ideas of what it is to make a, and participate in a certain kind of theatre, and he's actually much more interested in working with the older musicians who've seen it all and done it all and are ready now to let all of that go and, 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 and play. And I think that, that applies very strongly to, to, to you know, that, that the... The way we're all, I think, attempting to change the institutions in different ways with different levels of embeddedness and engagement in the kind of system as it is right now. Um, and the question of what you hang on to and what you leave behind applies everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It's been interesting working with um, you know the the MA you know, students who come 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 through having uh, learning you know dec de decorative arts pra practice whatever that actually is. Um, so I'm very skeptical about this whole thing, and I think they're actually very conservative. They're actually more conserv um, conserv um, conservative, perhaps, than the institutions that might employ them in the future. They, they, they have a very um, historic view of how the organisations they are training, training to work in should be, and if those institutions change too much to, to, to respond to the present, they feel kind of like, but that's not what I was training to be. And it's, yeah, it's how what, do we change that? You know? It's what a guy called Frank Lance calls, calls the Coors problem, which is, you know, he went to a friend's house with his, with his wife, and there were two Coors in the fridge. And so he went to the store and bought them a six pack of Coors because he wanted to go to be social. He's like, why don't you buy us Coors? We hate Coors. And he's like, but it was in the fridge. <laughs> I mean, but that's because we haven't drunk it, because it's sort of stuck there. <laughs> you know, like we, these things that are left over that we still sort of then kind of keep referring back to as ways of doing things, hold an, an enormous amount back. And do you find, Ben, in your practice with the reflection that that enables you to think about what's, what you're doing because it's always been done and what you're doing because it's actually effective now? Sorry, say that again? Do you find that you're able to actually look at why some, some things are done because they've always been done that way? And some things are done because they're actually effective for. Yeah, I think I think <coughs> at least in the in the process that we're going that we've been going through the last few weeks is there was initially this idea that we would just like kind of flatten and start at ground zero. So we decide how to manage the toilet and the cooking and like go from the very, the real baseline of the infrastructure. But what we found in that process is that you end up reinventing the wheel over and over again. So, like, how do you initiate uh, effective collaboration when you're trying to build an institution? Well, <laughs> the kind of uh, historical, 
historical analog for that would be like the human resource department, but instead we go out and we say, we're open for everybody, please come and join us. And that kind of, those kind of permission mechanisms don't necessarily work. And I think that this is one of the things, even in the process of starting a new institution or working with existing ones, is trying to describe that permission mechanism is probably the, the hardest bit because you can't just say everything is open, come and participate. It just doesn't work. And I think there's probably a long-standing history within institutions and a lot of knowledge there on actually how to initiate that. But there isn't necessarily the capacity or desire at a higher level to go there because it's scary. It's a, it's a you know, the, the affordances of any system or place or network of systems or network of, of uh, locations, when we design, like, I think there's a, a lot of my thinking about institution design, um, which I never thought I'd get into, but I'm, I'm sort of, I have arrived at by mistake having run an organization that ran out of space because there was no kind of institutional kind of context in which we could develop. Um, but actually the kind of practice of being a game designer is very much about understanding, especially a game designer for a public space. You look at a building, whether it's a gallery or Kensington Palace or this room, and there are certain things that you can do in it and there are certain things that you can't do in it. Um, you know, we can clear the ch chairs around and run around and have a pretty good time. We can't plug a projector into the wall and have it project something onto that wall. Is, is, that's, that's a thing that would need some other scaffolding and some other kind of materials. And so actually, that was what our design practice was kind of all about, was trying, you know, gradually coming to terms with there is a reality of an infrastructure and an inherited set of opinions and, and things, and you can't not work with that. You have to work with that ground, but then it's what can you do, and when do you need to knock a wall down? <laughs> Every day. Yeah, mostly, <laughs> mostly that's my view now, is mostly we should just knock more stuff down. So how do we get institutions to the point where there might be something like design patterns that we'd use in architecture or in um, interface design or technology where you say if you want to solve this situation then these are the design patterns that you might use. If you want to make your building digital, if you want to build flexibility into the fabric of an organisation, are there ways that we can share the lessons? I mean, I think, I mean, I think the thing that excites me about hearing about the, un the unmonastery is how rapidly a corpus of knowledge could build up around this new thing. Um, and it sounds like that's already happening. Yeah, it's and it sounds terrifying. I mean, yeah. We already have a manual for how to run the entire building. Right. Um, and and I, I want to read that. I want to read the Book of Mistakes more than I can say. I just think like, the, book of, the Book of Mistakes has made me so happy. Like, that is a beautiful idea, and I'm, I'm really thrilled that you've done it. But yeah, like, it's um, so. I think that there is this really strong argument for being able to run fast without any kind of institutional tethering. And that's not a thing that a risk averse funding culture lets us do. Um, you know, there's no, there is no context in which you can propose doing a thing that doesn't have a clearly defined outcome. Well, there, there is if you've got the in-house capacity to think of, to think to and hide those things. Yeah. And I think that, that I mean, you, you were talk, talking about this in, in this morning's fireside chat, is that the, the, the institutions have outsourced so many things mm -hmm. over such a period of time that they've lost the capacity to do the prototyping to, to become, become comfortable with fa failure. Right. Because the only model of securing money to do pro pro projects is to say it's going to work and this is what's going to be built. And, and, and until you bring the in-house skills back, yeah. which, is, which is kind of what we've done at Cooper Hewitt, it was very hard to, to do, but without that, we couldn't make those jumps, you know, I think. And, and we'll see if it pays off, I, I don't know. How do you define capacity within that context? Is that like human time or like the space or the infrastructure? Uh, time, inf in infrastructure and skills. Okay. You know, I think uh, hiring people who are familiar with the di digital space and live on the net network mm -hmm. and it's part of their lives is, is, is part of what makes, uh, makes that possible. But they need to be in senior positions. If, if, if you're just hiring, you know, the junior staff there, 
they never have the, 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 the ability to do the change. Yeah, the leverage. Yeah. And it's it's, it's yeah. kind of you know, important, I think, to reference GDS. In yes, this exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, especially in kind of contrast to what happened with healthcare.gov. Yeah. Um, you know, it is possible to create new institutions because we just did. Yeah. It just happened. Um, three years ago, GDS was not a, didn't exist, and now it's part of our institutional public service landscape. Um, having, as, you know, as you know, defined this incredibly progressive uh, view of what it means to make digital public services, and just enacted it and got on with it. But My that, question I think for GDS is. They have the in-house resources, they can prototype things, they can throw things mm -hmm. together, they can have these amazing conversations in front of whiteboards with post-it notes. Most organisations have lost those resources yeah. or never had them. Mm -hmm. So how do you do, how do you be a GDS if you don't have that level okay. of resource? I think specific, it's not like uh, <clears throat> the people that are a part of GDS are paid at like industry level. Like I think the, the ne necessity for what they what they're doing and what they've built has really come from the drive of individuals realizing the weight of responsibility in the context of where government is heading and have taken that on and i think that's one of the, why i asked you specifically about capacity because the simple design pattern for getting an institution to kind of get into gear about what's happening is just silo a budget bring on four five kids and say do whatever you want um, and you know, build the APIs that you want to plug into the different services. That's basically, that's the design pattern. And as soon as you've got five people who feel like they're driven towards something that they believe is valuable, then it's, you, don't, you don't even need to micromanage it past that point. You probably need to do some quite uh, heavy risk analysis on what that looks like. But I, mean, I would but say the wholesale firing of boards and senior directors in cultural organisations would be an effective way of... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really serious. I'm actually genuinely serious. Um, in the same way that um, Fortune 500, FTSE 100 companies have a colossal hiring problem, um, so there is a colossal hiring problem at the, at the top level of cultural organisations. You know, the, the deck chairs continually get rearranged. The people who are on those boards that change glacially, if at all. Um, there is no one. Well, that's not true. There are very there are, the the voices that are enlightened that understand the requirement to change are usually marginalised and kind of um, set against a much more powerful voice for perpetuating a status status quo which is built around existing kinds of culture. So, you know, that, that would be another way to do it. So we're going to hire good people, let them get on with things, use the culture of perpetual beta to reduce the amount of risk because they'll show us things as they're developing and get rid of all the directors that we currently have and then everything's... <laughs> some, 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 some combination of those things. And I think, you know, I mean, uh, I proposed in a, in a talk at another conference recently the idea of a fund for funders. So... Um, right now we spend a hell of a lot of money on innovation. You know, there's all of this money getting rooted through existing cultural organisations. And I would argue that a lot of that money is, if not wasted, then certainly very wastefully allocated. So um, instead, scoop up all of that money. Now, so not new money, this is existing money that you just kind of take out of places like the BBC and, and put into this pot. And then say to anyone, if you want to fund new domains of cultural practice which are currently poorly served by... Um, uh, you know, the existing provision, then apply and fund that work, measure it, analyse it. If it does more, if it does better than the um, old funders were doing, then you can have more of their money. And, um, you know, introduce a bit of the sort of, that would, I think that would introduce some dynamism into the system and, and maybe kind of provoke a, a kind of change and is maybe, is maybe a bit more feasible than my fire everyone plan. I think, I think that's true to an extent, but I think the, the risk comes in these scenarios is that uh, people tend to marginalize themselves in opposition um, and like thinking about the idea of kind of firing all the directors um, doesn't always serve the situation particularly well because I th I th from my experience of encountering various like high level institutions is that there are a lot of people trying to do their best and they're getting crushed by the responsibility that's upon them particularly in the context of cuts and things like that and actually there is a real responsibility on a younger generation to start to try and like take take some of that responsibility and and, and know what that that feels like, um, 
and that's one thing that's definitely not happening. And, and until you, before you can even begin to have a conversation of like handing down power in any way, it's like there needs to be trust and there needs to be an understanding for each process. And like anything, you know, any form of iterative development is terrifying like to people who need to make sure that everything's running smoothly. I mean, also thinks of, I also think it's about choo choosing which services uh, you do first. So, I mean, you know, wh one of the things we were very keen to make sure happened was that all of the work that my teams were doing was not just the external facing websites, mobile stuff, you know, all that sort of games, retail, all that sort of stuff. But actually, one of the main reasons we started to push into this acquisition stuff was that that forced a core, core, core change in the, in, in, the, in, in the museum and forced the museum to, to face up to the challenge of di digital preservation by acquiring things that we actively knew were really hard to keep running. So that app that I showed actually doesn't run on iOS 7. It's still available in the app, the, uh, um, in the app kind of store, but, but actually by, by acquiring that, because it's a really good, good, good piece of work, but by acquiring a thing that was immediately challenging forced a lot of the other departments within the organisation, the, the conservation teams, the rest of the curatorial, to actually start to engage with, okay, it's not just about climate and big warehouses and stuff. We now have got, 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 got to begin to figure out what the new services we need to run may actually be. We may have entirely the wrong staff to run those services in the future, but without that sort of uh, dead cat being put on the table, you don't talk about it, right? So, y you know, um, and we have the lu luxury of doing the building at the same time, although, you know, all this change at once kind of creates a, a, an ageing environment, I should say, uh, but also one where you have to make, make uh, choices. And so that, that crisis almost, that, that self-brought-on uh, Christ crisis has been really val valuable. Okay. We're just about out of time. So just oh, yes. to sum up, if, um, if possible, if you can think of something on the spot, what one thing would you ask cultural institutions to look at or to change in the next year? Um, I, I think I think Seb's idea of uh, allowing your institution to be plunged into crisis actually sounds like quite a good one. Um, I think uh, rather than setting setting up your processes to avoid crisis um, and that you know and, and therefore be stable, be well run, but never change, like figure out a way in which that that crisis could occur. Well, I think the bombs have gone, so it's time for Seb to jump in his oh, yeah. taxi in. Do join me in thanking the speakers.